Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Soundweb Studios. Visit online at soundwebstudios.com for all your needs and brought to you by our official sponsor, the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author, Me and Most of the Missing, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. We're here with a terrific lady who is an award winning children's advocate in digital media, affecting children ranging from social media to violence in the news. She worked three decades to improve the lives of young children. Recently, she was a senior advisor to Governor Gavin Newsom of California focusing on the um, the early childhood development, also served in executive and various leadership roles and um, imp implementing a number of, um, you know, things also involved in First Five, San Mateo, D.C. and the state of California, also um, leader in the implementing of the Project Proposition 10. And uh, she, uh, about the organization, it's basically becoming the nation's leading nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing and supporting the interdisciplinary, informative, and educating um, the uh, public on child health and wellness when it comes to social media as well, too. And, of course, you know, this has been in the news lately and a lot discussed as well, too. This is something very important. If you have um, children, you might want to check this out. Live, ladies and gentlemen, from Plus Studios in beautiful downtown San Jose, the, um, the leader of Children's and Screens Institute of Digital Media and Child Development, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Perry. Chris, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Wow, what a pleasure. Nice to be here. Well, it's great to have you on board, uh, Chris. So you're an award-winning child advocate for in digital media, affecting children ranging from social media to um, violence in the news. There's been a lot of it. You worked three decades to improve the lives of um, young children, and you worked uh, recently senior advisor to Governor Gavin Newsom in California and also served in executive and leadership roles in First Five in San Mateo, California, D.C., and the state of California. You're also one of the early leaders in implementing Proposition 10, and your organization's becoming the nation's leading nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing and supporting the interdisciplinary and informative and educating the public for children's health and well-being. And you have a new project, Children's and Screens, the Institute of Digital Media and Child Development. And before we get into all that, Chris, tell us how you first got started. Wow, what a great introduction. Thank you so much for, for having me on. I, I think that uh, I my very first job out of graduate school was as a social worker here in the Bay Area where um, families at that point in time were struggling with some of the very same things families are struggling with today. Um, you know, just having enough to eat, having affordable housing, good transportation, good education, good health care. Um, and, and it was those early days, those early years that led me to the position I'm in today where I'm still thinking and working on how to make sure children have a healthy and happy childhood, that they're not uh, experiencing harm or they're not exposed to harmful products. And I'm also looking for ways to provide support to researchers and others that are looking for answers to some of these hard questions about what is actually good for children and what's actually not good. And that may sound simple, but there are really complicated studies going on and other research to, to try to answer some of those questions. Mm. And what are some of the research that you have um, are referring to as well, too, and since there's so many of it, especially some that are significant? Yes. So the reason for the research is that we've seen this massive uptick in the use of digital media, social media by children, very young children even. And, and, and it's alarming in a sense that just 10 years ago, well, 12 years ago in 2010 was really the first time we all had smartphones in our pockets and we were interacting with a social media app known, known as Facebook at the time, but now there are many, many more. And, and it, over that short amount of time, we've seen an increase from a few you know, percent of children on smartphones and such social media to more than 84% of teens, 13 to 18 who are using social media every day. We know that they're also um, spending two hours and in some cases nine and 10 hours a day on their phones, on social media. And all of that, when we don't really know how it's going to impact them, we don't know for sure that it's helping them. Early science, early research is starting to show us that there are increased um, cases of depression and social comparison, and there are some self-esteem issues emerging from this research, particularly around girls, teens and tweens, because social media is really, if you think of it really, it's, it's, an, it's a way to engage all of us in a product that is meant to provide profits to those companies. So the longer we're on that product, the more we're using it, the more money they're making. And so that motivation doesn't always lead to a sort of an altruistic 
approach to children. They're, the children are seen as more sort of like customers rather than you know, young, vulnerable people, which they are. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and of course, you talked about the uh, early um, stages and everything else. We're trying to get some uh, statistics as well, too, that, um, you, you know, especially on mental health is like, what are some of the early returns when it comes to um, mental health so far at this point? Yeah, so there is just, you know, not, there isn't a significant amount of research, which is one of the reasons why children in screens and the Institute are, are so important to, to, to helping to solve some of these hard questions. So we need more funding and more research to answer more questions. But there is some, 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 there are some findings that are showing that children who are on uh, digital media, many hours per day, many days per week, are starting to experience different symptoms. Um, everything from being agitated and anxious when asked to stop, to sleep deprived because they're on it late at night or all night, to worse outcomes such as anxiety, depression. In some cases, they're seeing that that anxiety or comparison is leading to, to eating disorders and other, other more difficult symptoms and so we're really trying to step back and take a hard look at what children are seeing how it's impacting their self-esteem how it's impacting their cognitive development their cognition and how it's just simply affecting their physical health are they active enough are they sleeping enough are they getting up and interacting with other people enough so that those critical early years when you're developing rapidly are maximized and you're spending more time with real people doing the things you need to do to grow up versus on a device, um, spending time on something that may or may not be high quality. You mentioned about cognitive development being affected. How is that in a way being affected and uh, how is this all tied in? Well, cognitive development starts really before you're born um, from the, the, the time you know, you're, you're in, in utero till, you know, frankly, until the day you die, your brain is going through different developmental changes. We know this, that in the first three years of life, you gain more brain weight than you do the rest of your life. As much as 90% of your brain weight is acquired in those first 36 months of life. And if you're on a device, which is not typical, not common, but it more and more I am seeing, I bet you are too, when you go out to dinner at or you are waiting for a bus or you're waiting at an airport or doctor's office, parents are giving their smartphones to very young children to sort of entertain them, keep them busy while they're waiting to do something else as a way to keep the child calm and relaxed, you know, because it can be hard to wait. It's hard to be bored, but what we know about brain development is that the more we interact with other humans, the more optimal our brain development is. We're actually wired to interact with others. We're social animals. And when we get in those very early years, it's really important to protect as much of the child's time from screens and more with adults as, or other kids as possible. As they get older and their brains are more developed, it's okay to introduce digital media, social media in small amounts, in controlled amounts, so that you know that you know what your child's being exposed to and that you're actually able to engage with them around what they're seeing and what they're feeling when they're doing it so that you can monitor how it's going. The, the final thing I'll bring up on cognition and brain development is one of the most important tasks of being a tween or a teen and a young adult is, is building more executive function more self-control, more impulse control, more ability to plan ahead and execute on goals. And that is part of brain development as well. That comes a little bit later in childhood. So we know you're gaining brain weight when you're young and we know you're perfecting different functions of the brain as you get older so that you can take on difficult tasks as an adult and, and manage difficult emotions, you know, because Look how hard it is uh, to to be in society today. There are lots of challenges and we want kids to be as prepared as they can be and have the best chance they have to succeed. And overexposure to social media and digital media and devices has not shown positive outcomes. Um, it, we're still waiting, to, we're still checking with research to see well, what are some of the negative outcomes so we can be more specific about this. 
it, you brought up about uh, having uh, kids on smartphones, Androids, and all the devices and everything else. You know, you know, many of us grew up on TV as well, too. Did TV have that same uh, impact, a uh, harmful impact, or do you think um, TV didn't have much of an impact on us like uh, kids are on social media? Well, technology in general, so you bring up a great point, right? Because there's always new technology coming. Television is a great example. Prior to that, somebody, have, it, man, I've heard people use the example of, you know, the printing press was a form of technology. It changed the way we told stories or, or heard stories. We didn't just hear them, we read them. Now television was a visual storytelling device. Now with computers and digital media, we've moved into a different realm where the technology is persuasive. It's designed to tailor itself to you. It, the more you interact with it, the smarter it gets and the more it engages with you in the way you want to be engaged with, the more it tells you what you want to hear, what you want to see. That is different fundamentally from a television, which is a passive viewing experience and is the same for everyone. When you move to these uh, social media apps or um, honestly, even search engines, right, are curating content for you minute by minute based on what you search what you stay longer on, et cetera. And I know people know this in your audience because it's just, in, it's becoming sort of, it's just really obvious. You, know, you go to type a sentence and it finishes a sentence for you. So it's not, it's not hidden from us. What we're trying to do at Children's Screens is say, okay, as adults, we make informed decisions about what we do and don't use. But for children, they're not really able to make informed decisions because their brains aren't fully developed and we don't really have all the information yet about what's what's either good for them or not good for them. Mm -hmm. And we have some guidelines as well, too, that parents can take to safeguard their children. We'll talk about that. But first, listen to The Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com, powered by SoundCloud Studios. Visit online at soundcrabstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Soundcrab Studios is the answer. Soundcrab Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition rate. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at soundcrabstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give an official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international war ring author, Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast paced mysteries, you love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target where truth is illusion and those you love will be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson says Gar Great Reviews and Evil Love and a George Pot, Howard Celebrities, including Joanna Cassie, Forge Riley, and many others. So grab your copy today for goals Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also check out the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com over 40 podcast platforms, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor FM, iTunes, and also on Apple Music as well, too. YouTube, Rumble, BitChute, heard on HamiltonRadio.net every Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. And if you network's coming soon, take the Mike Widener Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok today. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags, hoodies. Makes great gifts 24-7. Go to Amazon.com, check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash me and Muslims here for great books like Missing, Once and Wrinkles, also T-shirts, pop sockets, hoodies, phone cases, and more. Amazon.com slash me and Muslims here. Check it out today. I'll support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, and themikewidenershow.com. Make sure you do so today. We're here with the war-winning children's advocate and digital media, Chris Perry, here on the Mike Widener Show, heading up the Children's and Screens Project, Institute of Digital Media and Child Development. And uh, before we get into the guidelines, and um, you know, you know, give, give us an overview about uh, Child and Screens and um, you know, a quick overview and how it came about. Oh, well, that's a great question. We came about a, a little over 10 years ago, and our founder was similar to many of the parents that are listening today was a little bit um, surprised and and concerned when when her children mostly her son started to use digital media in this case it was uh, video games in such a way that it really it really surprised her and it, it actually made her look for information what what is this why is he why does he seem different why is he agitated why is it hard for him to stop what do I do as a parent there really weren't very many answers so she as a physician decided, to launch an institute to research these questions 
more deeply and has been supporting the work ever since that time. And the work itself really is uh, funding new research to answer some of the questions I'm talking about today, but also translating the science that many people are doing across the, around the world around these topics so that parents can understand the research more easily and policymakers can understand the, the information. And we hope that when that science is translated into more understandable language, that people will take action either in their own homes with their own children because they have the information or in the case of policymakers, they'll say, we should help all parents. We shouldn't leave everything to individual parents to figure out. Maybe there are some protections we can put in place to pr for children so that their parents don't have to be ahead of the game every day, every night. Um, I'm sure people are worn out by this because it turns into a bit of a power struggle um, when you're, when you're, especially as your children get older and they have a lot of autonomy to say, you know, I want you to put that phone away. I want you to leave your phone in the kitchen overnight. I want you to leave your phone at home when you're at school. It just turns into to a really tough conversation and families are, are I, parents are weary of the conversation at this point. Mm -hmm. and, and also maybe think too that the, uh, the use or abuse of phones has taken place even in restaurants as well too and I'll share my story of it I took my family out to a nice um, Mexican restaurant in western North Dakota and met by a singing waiter who was very entertaining and we're sitting there having our meal and he was sitting there singing away singing away we're all enjoying it and he was the only one that do it there and the other people like how come you're not coming to our table he says that's because they're on their phones that's why so <laughs> And I, and I just want to share a great story. The fact that um, you don't have to be on your phone all the time. It's like you can just sit there, eat and be entertained. And the only time you look up at your phone is when you're trying to get information, answer a question. But you're not on here just to look at news or do what's going on Facebook and Instagram. Or unless you want to just figure out, um, you know, you know, what's the bill, what's the charge, get reviews and everything else. So that's just another case. And, of course, you know, speaking about um, how how, how, how long uh, – a teen should be on there are there are rules we had back in the days like you're not allowed to watch like say two hours of tv one hour of tv three hours of tv it depends on if it's like day month week and everything else and um how much screen time are children allowed uh to be on their uh their phones their tablets and uh all the um multi multimedia devices how long do you think What's the recommended screen time for kids these days? Yeah, well, unfortunately, there really isn't such a thing as a recommended amount. There, the one thing I can point to that the, the APA says for children under two years of old, they really shouldn't be on screens at all. Um, as children get older, you know, they, they're preschool age, school age. They can, you know, I think small amounts, you know, a couple of hours a week if they're very young, or maybe an hour a day as they get closer to school age. And, and the, 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 the longer you can hold off giving it to your children for lengthy periods, the easier that whole, that whole trajectory is. You know, If you start off with big chunks when they're very young, and we talked about brain development, they, they are acquiring you know, a preference for screen time over maybe other things like running around outside with their friends or sitting in the living room talking to you while you fold laundry you know the things that you would like them to be doing they're not they're going to you're going to be competing with that device if you so the later you can put that up the better the question you also asked is like what can you do if you do have teenagers and they have had a smartphone for a long time this is where we really strongly suggest that families have almost like a media plan where you sit down together and, and parents too because parents are guilty of being on their phones at the dinner table, being on their phone in the car, being at their phone in restaurants. So you kind of have to come to this conversation knowing that it's time for you to make some changes too, but you're modeling what's important to your kids, which is that face-to-face -face conversation, interaction that you just described so beautifully. Um, and you can create that plan together. Everybody's old enough to talk about how many hours per day, old enough to talk about when to put it away at night so they can get some sleep when they can, you know, what apps are maybe okay and some that maybe aren't so okay. And then I'll talk about something that's very sensitive and as children get older, they're more and more, they're exposed to violent video games, pornography, other kinds of violence. And you really want to keep tabs on not only how much screen time, but what they're viewing while they're on their screens. Because they're both important questions to, to talk to your kids about. 
and also violence in the news as well too with all the yes and everything else i mean we don't need to go into that so it's like you know i guess how much of filter can you apply to um all the news stories that's going on and how much content can they handle and you know what if the kid decides to um you know copycat after that shooter and of course you know there's also been some hacking going on and of course you know you know kids have the ability to hack into people's phones and um other phones in as young as what three four and five it's like how can that be prevented and monitored yeah, well, I, I'm glad you brought up that other point. It's not just smartphones and tablets and devices. It's the television that's considered a screen and there is content that can be violent and kids are seeing more and more violent content on the news. And so the, there are lots of different, it, there's lots of different advice, but it's very much case by case. And it is helpful to understand at what age your child is being exposed to this, how to interact. What most of these experts are saying at this point is if this happens, it's really important to engage in a conversation with some open-ended questions. You don't have to come at it and say, you saw that, that, that horrible thing on the news. Here's what it meant. Here's why it happened. You know, launch into an explanation. Better to step back and say, I'm, I, I noticed that the TV was on while that story about the school came up. Did you, what did you think? What did you see? What do you, hmm. what do you, what do you want to know? And, and that's also just good advice in general with children is the more you can listen and op uh, ask open-ended questions, the more you'll learn about what they're actually processing, what they actually think and what may actually be going on. I, lots of times parents tell funny stories about asking, you know, they're really worried that the child's had a, a very difficult experience and they find out the child wasn't really even paying attention and, and didn't didn't notice or couldn't process it, and so it's it's an easier conversation than they expect it to be. Mm -hmm. But and, again, and yeah. Go ahead. I'm advice, sorry. I'm sorry. The advice always is stay as a be as aware as you can be and as communicative as you can be, because you're sending also the message to the child. I'm here and I'm available to talk about these things, even if I miss it. You can always come back to me and ask me a question later. And, and then how can the parents walk the line in terms of monitoring our kids' behaviors without violating their privacy? That seems to be a, a real tough issue. How, how can uh, they walk the line? Yeah, it's such a great question. And especially as children get older and they get closer to adulthood and they're experiencing their own autonomy and their own individ individualness. Um, but I want to, you know, again, like I said earlier about parents having to model, this is, it may seem like it's a privacy issue, but in fact, they're still children. And it's probably a device you own and pay for, or pay for the subscriptions and et, et cetera. It's your internet, it's your power bill. It's, it, this is your device. You're allowing your child to use it. Um, and so one thing to re, just to try to remember is that you're doing something that may feel unfair or you're violating their privacy rights, but in fact, those aren't actually the same as if you were an adult and you had rights to privacy. So we want to walk that fine line. And again, communication, communication, communication. If your child, um, if you feel that they're being open with you about what they're seeing and what they're doing online and you feel comfortable with them having their device, I think, you know, you have to trust them. But it, sometimes I, I think parents have often feel like there's something going on that isn't great. There, there are kids that are being cyber bullied. There are kids who are experiencing you know, terrific anxiety because they don't, they, they have the fear of missing out. They don't feel like they belong. They don't feel like they're good enough. They're not popular. They're, they're exposed to such large numbers of other children online that isn't typical. Like if you were at just a school campus, you wouldn't know this many teenagers, but when you're online, it's the, it's infinite. And so that raises anxiety in children in a way that is hard to manage sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you want, you yeah, go ahead. And it's also been a big issue with cyberbullying as well, too. And of course, you know, you know, there's been talk about government getting involved with these, some of these issues. And what do we make of it? And um, are we at a point, are we wanting the government involved or are we just simply say, stay out of it? Well, I mean, obviously, people have very different views on how much government involvement is necessary. And I and I really respect that, you know, that we all want our privacy. And as adults, we should, you know, stand up for what we believe in. In the case of children, What's worrisome is that they're being marketed to, their data is being collected and sold. Oh my and gosh. they're also being, you know, as I said earlier, because per technology is persuasive and intelligent, it's really, really hard to stay ahead of the content coming at them. And then, and even the settings on their phones being changed so that more and more information is flowing out of their phone, including images of them. 
all over all over the internet. And so what we think is necessary at the Institute is not only more research to help us understand what exactly is going on with these, these apps, but some basic protections that go in, that protect all children. In other words, you have to opt in to not opt out of certain privacy settings. You have to have parental permission. You have to be of a certain age because we know that the brain is not yet developed enough to, to know to do certain things. Adults don't always know these things. Um, so we look to policymakers to put some protections in place for children so that they're not leaving childhood with a digital footprint that they can't undo and is will follow them um, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And of course, any positives in terms of what kids are doing online? Yes, there are some positives. It's really been great to see some interesting Community, community building efforts and, and social movement efforts. And you, you probably can think of a few, but we know like around environment and climate that young people are coming together online across the world to talk about um, you know, what they can do, how they can be active. There are communities like LGBTQI teens that are often isolated and don't have any friends mm -hmm. like themselves where they live. They can go into communities where they find other teens like themselves. And then finally, I didn't mention this, especially with young children, but all kids, video chatting with family members, you know, having fun with real people like we're doing right now for a while is fine. This is this is also a really positive use of screen time. It's, it, it allows for some connection. And during the pandemic, we know how isolated the kids were. And that, that, that one of the positive things was being able to see friends online. And so we really we really encourage that um, connection. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a very good thing as well, too. And where can we find uh, more information? How can they access uh, children and uh, screens? Please visit our website at www.childrenandscreens.com, where we have um, access to all of our Ask the Experts webinars, many of which have covered topics we've covered today, Mike. But also we have tip sheets. We also have summaries of all the, the legislation that's moving through Congress and some of the states. And finally, um, we have uh, updates on events that are going on that they that parents may want to attend or things that they may find interesting. We will certainly check that out. And what's coming up for Chris Perry and Children's and Screens in uh, 2022 and beyond? We'll find out just one minute. You listen to the Mike Widener Show at the themikewidenershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. And brought to you by our official sponsor, the Mike Widener Show, international warring author Mia Molson Zia Missing, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. We'll be back with Chris Perry of Children's and Screens after this time out. We're back with Chris Perry of Children's and Screens, Institute of Digital Media and Child Development here on the Mike Widener Show. Very informative talk, topic and very important discussion and something to learn. And we hope uh, for those who are uh, watching and listening out there, parents and children, we hope you uh, take all this information and apply it as well too. And what else can we expect from you and your organization in 2022 and 23 and beyond, Chris? Thanks for the question. We're, um, our, we're, experience, we're gonna have our 10th anniversary next year. So we're gonna kick off the year with a gala in January where we'll be hosting a presidential lecture with Frances Haugen, who was the Facebook whistleblower who in many ways peeled back some of the, the layers of what's going on in these in social media uh, companies and how they're collecting data and how they're perfecting it. Uh, so that'll be a really exciting event to hear more from her. In the middle of the year, we'll be putting together a supplement, which is a big research uh, journal for, for cross-disciplinary researchers to come together and talk about this issue. And then in the fall, we're having our third scientific Congress in Washington, DC where we'll bring researchers together from around the world to learn more, but also to talk directly to policymakers and, and seek some support and help from them on some of these issues. We'll certainly keep up to date on that as well, too. And who do you consider biggest influence in your career, Chris? Oh, what a great question. I'd have to say Marion Wright Edelman, um, who launched the Children's Defense Fund and is still an advocate today for children, particularly children furthest from opportunity. Okay, and what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Listen, listen, listen. Pay careful attention to what you're hearing, and make 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 steps to improve what improve problems that that you know are important right now. 
And most importantly, put down your phones when necessary. So that's the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing to do sometimes. Yes, I right. agree. <laughs> I, I forgot to do that. I forgot to remind everybody to put down the phones and listen, but we'll do that another time. We'll have you on. So we're here with Chris Perry with Children's and Screens Institute of Digital Media and Child Development here on the Mike Wagner Show. Chris, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Looking forward to having you soon. Keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love to have you back. And once again, what's your website? How do people contact you? And where can people get more information about children's and screens and more? www.childrenscreens.com. All right, we'll check that out. Once again, Chris, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Looking forward to having you soon. Keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love to have you back. We wish you all best. And Chris, you and your organization have a great future ahead of you. Thank you.